Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, here with my co-host Solomon Box. Solomon, going? how are you doing today? Doing great. Good. Good to hear. And uh, Ashley is not with us today. She is currently on spring break, somewhere warm. So she's Spring uh, break. Yeah, spring break. <laughs> she's getting a tan. Um, I got a little bit red earlier, but it's not from somewhere warm. I was just up at Lake Winnipeg. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But we have a special guest with us in the studio, Jason Mitchell. Jason, how are you doing today? Hey, great uh, great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. So, um, hey, what have you been up to lately? Give us a little bit about uh, wh- what's been going on the past couple of months. Uh, you know, well, a lot of ice fishing, obviously, and we're just starting to do some open water fishing. We're kind of caught between the two worlds right now where we still have good ice on Devil's Lake. We still have, you know, we're starting to shore fish on Devil's Lake around some of the bridges and stuff. We're starting to open up. But, uh, you know, this upcoming week, we're going to be heading up to Lake Winnipeg, and then uh, we're going to be heading over to the Rainy River and heading over to Green Bay. So we've got a pretty full slate ahead of us here, but we're just kind of moving from, you know, looking forward like everybody to, you know, obviously experiencing some of the best ice fishing of the winter, but at the same time, we're also looking forward to getting in a boat and putting the ice stuff to bed and, and moving on to the next season. So we're mm-hmm. <laughs> going from one thing to the next. I've got a mess in my shop. I've got ice stuff laying around. i got open water stuff laying around trying to get ready. Best time of the year, really, yeah, you know. It's time for organization now. <laughs> Getting yeah. everything put away. Yeah, I love this time of year. Yeah, exactly. It's just kind of that transition period. Yeah, you know, you know and, and I, I just caught a couple of fish this morning, you know, pitching a jig in plastic and, you know, and goodness, using a long rod again and the thump of a fish hitting a plastic. I mean, <laughs> I miss that. So <laughs> once you get that, once you get a taste of like, once I get on open water, whether it's in a river or whatever, I have a hard time going back to the ice, you mm-hmm. know? So I'm trying to get all my ice stuff done so that way I can just go to the rivers and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you get that period after open water season where you almost can't fish for a little bit till the ice gets good yeah, enough anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we love the seasons up here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you plan on going out with a bang, though, at Winnipeg, though. That should be Oh, yeah, fun. yeah. I always joke with people, you've never been up there. It's like tasting sugar for the first time. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, stupid numbers of fish at times. Obviously, you have the potential for big fish. And uh, you can catch fish doing some things that you maybe won't, wouldn't catch fish in other places, you know, jigging big spoons really aggressively and stuff. It's just a cool place. I love going up there. So I'm looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. And I, I just returned from Winnipeg. So I'd, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit on that because okay. I was there for three days. So the first day fishing was pretty good. I mean, they would hit nearly anything we would throw at them. Mm -hmm. You know, I was catching a lot on rattle baits. Uh, I tried out the new Berkeley finisher Mm -hmm. and actually had some really good luck for that. I love the action of that new bait. You know, it's kind of like a sort of a new age jig and wrap where you can really dart and have it be erratic. And and I used the size number seven and and those walleyes really liked it. Mm -hmm. But um, then we started to have an increase in pressure. And the, you know, the temperature really didn't sway all that much, but you could tell the pressure was r- raising a little bit Yeah, and it, it pretty much like gave those fish lock jaw. So like we were trying shallow, we tried deep, we tried middle and you know, I had, I had the live scope with, so like we were scanning around and we weren't, you know, actively trying to catch them until we were finding, you know, pods of fish. So like we knew the fish were down there, like yeah. we could see them. I marked literally like thousands of fish, but I could not get them to bite. So I'm curious, like, what would your strategy be in that situation? Well, I mean, just a disclaimer. I mean, I've had many days where I couldn't get them to bite. You know, you try different things until you run out of time. But, you know, like last year when we were up there, it was kind of unique in the sense that it's one of the, it's, it's a time where, you know, it was an off bite, you know, where the fish weren't chasing the aggressive stuff. I mean, we've seen it where, you know, you'd get, some big fish maybe on rattle baits in the morning, then they, the fish would ignore that, but then you could still get them on flutter spoons, or you know, you could maybe tweak your uh, presentation, but you're still jig, you know, and you're still, you know, have fish flying in on the screen and, and eating. But, you know, last year was, was, a, was a situation where, you know, we saw dead sticks work really well. You know, even like a, you know, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but even like a salted shine or even a frozen herring, you know, just pinned horizontally on a dead stick or, you know, people call them, you know, livelies up there, you know, live minnows, fathead minnows. They have a mud minnow that they sell up there that uh, can work really well. But, uh, you know, there's times where you can, you can, you know, 
do a lot more dead stick type stuff. And you'll see pretty quickly if that's the case because, you know, they'll, they'll come in and eat that, whereas they won't come in on the, on the aggressively jig stuff. But, you know, the other thing, too, is like with forward-facing sonar, you know, I always feel like it makes good bites better, but it can make tough bites tougher in the sense that if you are on a tough bite and the fish are just in a funk, uh, sometimes that extra power just pushes them away where you see them where they just don't want to come underneath you or they just kind of show up on the edges of the screen or if they're say three feet four feet off the bottom and they go into the bottom and then you know just turn it off you know and just you know and so uh, you know that's a situation where we probably see that you know give or take you know on the ice we probably see that maybe 20 percent of the time Mm -hmm. whereas it seemed like it would just catch more fish. Use it to find the fish, see if there's activity, which if the fish are right on the bottom, you almost have to let it sit and wait for fish to crawl across the screen. Yeah. They don't show up as easy. You have to wait for them to move <clears throat> to, to really sh show up. But, uh, you know, use it to find fish, but then, you know, go back to your Vexlar to catch them. So. Yeah, that forward-facing sonar is definitely a blessing and a curse. Oh, for sure. Like, it's, it's a tool. Absolutely. Yeah, thinking about that in my fishing, like, I, I just strictly stayed with the live scope because I didn't have another yeah. Well, up there, too, me. sometimes those big fish run right underneath the ice. Like, mm -hmm. like, if you're in, say, 10 feet of water, for example, or 7 feet of water, those fish might be 2 feet down under the ice. And those big fish are riding high, and they're just cruising. And with forward-facing sonar, for example, you can see those fish before they get to you so that you can pull up and fish them. Whereas sometimes with the Vexlar, for example, you don't see them until it's too late, you know, and you don't realize how much is going on around you. And so, you know, everything has its pros and its cons. You know, mm -hmm. I, I still feel like if you really want to maximize your fishing, if you have a Vexlar, buy forward-facing sonar. But if you don't have anything at all, I think if you just had one unit, just go with the Vexlar because of the universalness of it and how nimble and easy it is to go from hole to hole. You, you know, it's, it's tough lugging forward-facing sonar around a lot. Yeah. Right. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna fish through ten holes, you're be moving, 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 and then you get a thirty inch wall on, you got a pole sticking down the water two feet underneath the ice. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the best setup, you know. And so they they really they they complement each other. It's like two D, in side imaging, right? Mm -hmm. You never say that. Well, side imaging is is the end all be all because there's times where you need two D. There's times where you need your temperature gauge. There's times where you need other tools. Okay. But at the same time, when you learn how to use all these different technologies and marry them together, to me, that's the magic you yeah. know, as far as just, you know, being as efficient and optimizing your time on the water. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's really one of the best things about the forward-facing sonar is being able to judge a fish's temperature. You know, like you can tell if they're aggressive. You can tell if they're a little bit lethargic. Well, it's shocking to see how fast they move. You know, I, I still feel like, you know, if you're using a Vexlar with that raw analog signal, it's still more, it's still faster. It's mm -hmm. still more real-time, whereas... When the fish are flying in and, you know, they're just eating whatever you do, then it's, it's not as noticeable. But when the fish are playing that nose game where they're right on you and you're just trying to figure out one little twitch, one little thing to get that fish to trigger, I feel like, you know, as far as when you're just close quarters, I still, I'm a lot more comfortable using a Vexilar as far as reading the attitude of the fish because you can tell when that fish changes body posture. When anything moves in that analog signal, you get that flutter effect. And so what that also enables you to do is look in the bottom itself easier and better in the sense that I'll look in the bottom for fish when they're on the edge of the cone angle when they're really tight to the bottom whereas if anything that's digital or even forward-facing sonar or fish are right tight to the bottom and if it's an uneven bottom you'll get a lot more blind spots where you can't look into the bottom okay so like I, how I describe it is like with forward-facing sonar when fish are tight to the bottom and it's an uneven bottom they'll come up out of the bottom and dip in and come up like almost like worms coming up and out of the mm -hmm. bottom you know and so you know, it's, it's, I think the biggest thing is you want to learn as much as you can, which that's what makes fishing fun for me is I want to learn as much as I can. Right? I mean, I'm just obsessed with fishing, and you never learn everything. You never have it all figured out, but it's just kind of that quest to, you know, you always want to know more. You know, yeah. and I think with forward-facing sonar, you get a lot of information where you feel like, wow, not only do I know more, but now I have even more questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's know? that's because like me. the distance fish travel sometimes to hit you, or to, you know, it, it's shocking. It's like wow, or how fast, how much they, they move. just come flying in. Yeah. You know, like like before forward facing sonar is an example. You'd go out the end of a point, you'd mark three fish off the tip of the point. You think, oh, there's three walleye sitting on the end of that point, right? I just had this mental picture of these three fish sitting there. The reality is that. They're moving all the time. They're moving all around. You know, mm -hmm. when you put forward-facing sonar down, like, wow, there's hardly any fish sitting anywhere. Like, yeah. they're moving all the time. You know, and that, mm -hmm. to me, was just one of the big eye-openers is just how much 
fish move and they're just cruising all the time it seems like yeah. i kind of want to go back to a, a different version of your first question about like what you do when you're there and you're on fish but they're not biting and stuff like you'll you'll realize the more we talk i'm much more into the hunting side of things and mm-hmm. stuff like that so i'm relatively new into the fishing world but like, well, the fish don't know or care that's the beauty that's of it. good that's good that's <laughs> what that's that works for me um but like how frequently is it that you would like change your bait or change your setup like because you might not necessarily move right away if you're on fish but they're not biting but you'll change a setup or change your presentation like how do you judge when to do that well i'll, I'll give you my perspective or strategy and it's by no means right i mean it works for me most of the all time but not get. all the time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh when I'm in search mode, when I'm trying to find fish, I'm not necessarily big on changing a lot because I feel like if I'm in the right place at the right time, I can use the wrong lure and I can use the wrong color. Okay? So when I'm just trying to find fish, I'm not hung up on, on all the little things. Okay? I'm hung up on trying to find fish. And usually if you land on fresh fish that haven't been touched, where you're fishing fresh ice and you're trying to find fish, which is basically what finding fish is, you're, you know, you're you're trying to you're, you're this is the where the hunting comes in right mm-hmm. you're trying to hunt them down right. okay when you're trying to find them and you're trying to find a school of fish all you need is one or two dumb ones to slow you down and stop you and, and then you roll up your sleeves and kind of figure it out mm-hmm. now once i find fish and i go like, wow well, you know either they're either they're coming up and they're stalling or i can see them coming in on the edges of the cone angle but they're just not coming in all the way you know, then I can make those adjustments, you know, and obviously if you have a couple people fishing with you, the more lines in the water around you, you have the, the better it is too, where it's easier to get lucky where mm-hmm. one person's using a big flutter spoon that's purple and you're using a rattle bait or whatever. And one person's caught four fish. The, everybody else has marked the same amount of fish, yeah. but not getting bit the same. Well, then you can make that adjustment pretty your fast. But, sign. but once you find fish, then it's a completely different deal. Once you find fish and you know you're on fish, and they're the fish that you want to catch, um, then it's a deal where you just have to almost like force yourself to go through the channels. You know, a lot of times I'm focusing more on cadence and jig stroke, how high, how I'm working that lure. And then I'm working on profile the lure, size. Um, color is the last thing that I worry about, okay? I'm not a big, huge color guy. Um, you know, again, if I'm in the right place at the right time, I can use the wrong color. Mm-hmm. but um, there is something to that, obviously, some days. But the only thing is, is there's a little bit of unpredictableness. Okay, there's so much BS with fishing. We're oh, match the hatch, do this, do that, whatever. You know what? What does fire tiger look like? What does purple descent look like? What does wonder bread look like? Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and in some cases, if it's that nitpicky, you're probably working the lure too slow in a lot of cases, right? I mean, people, it's psychological warfare where I've seen people. You know, they'll catch fish on, say, a pink jig with chartreuse eyes, and they'll drive 100 miles to find more jigs like that and drive by 15 shops that have pink jigs with green eyes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's got, you know, it's, it get, a lot of stuff in gets in our head, and if we're not confident with something, you don't fish the same. Yeah. Right? If you don't think a lure is going to work, it won't. Okay? And if you think that it will, then a lot of times you'll use it till it does. Yeah. And so there's a lot of there's a lot crazy. of mind games with fishing, you know, yeah. and, and so you're dealing with that as well. But um, as a rule of thumb, I like you know if it's sunny out, if it's sun, I like to use uh, you know what I call foils or metallics, you know, gold, silver, you know, things that have some flash and shine. If it's cloudy and gray, I like to use more painted lures. But that's just a general rule of thumb, you know. At the end of the day. A lot of things work. And you just have to try different things. But uh, I experiment with color last. Yeah. You know, that's, I feel like there's so many more things that are higher on the importance than color. Sure. Shape, size, vibration, jig stroke, you know, water displacement. Um, sometimes you can tweak your rod and line to match up with it better. Where on some of the toughest bites, I feel like um, monofilament gives you an edge. Okay. Especially with dead sticking. Like if you're down, like sometimes when, when nothing else works, just a jig and a half minnow or a full minnow you know will catch fish really well through the ice right. you know and when they won't hit rattle baits and some of the other stuff and um you know so i'm experimenting with that kind of stuff you know and and obviously the more history you have the more confidence you have doing all those different things mm-hmm. and there's some people that just can't wrap their head around using a rattle bait and it's really hard for them to 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 get confident with it or comfortable yeah. with it you know you have to just get on a good bite sometime and and you know start catching fish with it and um What's interesting about Winnipeg too, and what, what makes it so fun and so unique is that, you know, touched on earlier how 
you'll catch fish on Winnipeg doing things that you wouldn't necessarily catch fish on in other places. You know, I, I swear that there's times up in Winnipeg where those fish are so aggressive in this big water, these fish are stained water, these fish are used to, you know, moving a lot and chasing down bait fish where, you know, you could take like a, a daredevil five of diamonds with no bait on it and just jig it like you're sitting in a slough in three feet of water fishing for the most aggressive three-pound northern pike you could imagine. <laughs> and that's what it takes up there to catch fish. Uh-huh. And if you stop and twitch and do all this other stuff that you know, we normally do with lures, say, like on a Mille Lacs or Devil's Lake or wherever, you know, those fish just stall. You know, and so I almost feel like sometimes I'd be better off closing my eyes and not even looking at my electronics and just doing this all day. Mm-hmm. Just get that lure pumping and jumping and, and crashing down into the mud and not, you lift up and just some of the biggest bites you could ever imagine. Well, I like what you said about Honest. the confidence there. It's because it's like, like, like I said, being relatively new to the fishing world, it's like there's so many different types of baits, but then also like the cadence that you fish them is different. Oh, yeah. And you have to be confident, like you said, in, in how you're going to fish that specific yeah, bait. Absolutely. And, and don't let it overwhelm you. I, mean, I always felt like, you know, if you're, you know, relatively new to fishing, for say, and you, uh, just want to get comfortable where you can go out and feel like you're you can you're a little bit of a threat to the fish and just go out and just catch some fish you know i always tell people you know find a mentor you know mm-hmm. it could be somebody at work somebody that lives down the road your neighbor whatever that does a lot of fishing and you know by and large you know people that fish a lot in an area they'll have things figured out where you know they'll have programs that work most of the time right you know uh, for example like you know right here in fargo you know we've got phenomenal fishing in the detroit lakes area otter tail uh, you go west and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff around Valley City and Jamestown, you know, and obviously you got Devil's Lake, Lake of the Woods, you got Northeastern South Dakota, whatever. But in any of those areas, you know, there's there's general programs that work most of the time, you sure. know, for, for different species of fish, whether you're targeting jumbo perch in the Dakotas or big bluegills and crappies, mm-hmm. you know, to the east, you know, um, you know, there's things that work most of the time. And for most people, that's good enough, right? Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you catch fish most of the time, what more so. can you ask for? You know, <laughs> yeah. nobody catches fish all the time anyways. Right. Right? I mean, so you don't want to know how many times we've, you know, tried things that didn't work. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, that's the only way you find out how things do work. Well, that, and then also, too, especially when you're looking for fish, um, you got to be willing to fish where there's nobody else and sometimes when you get done with it you realize oh now i know why there's nobody on this lake or <laughs> no yeah. there's nobody fishing over here there's no fish here you know yeah. but i mean you got to be willing to do that to find the best bites and that can be daunting too just going to a lake they haven't been to and like with with a lack of knowledge of it because like me like in this area I've, i was blessed because i grew up in northeast south dakota i didn't fish around there a ton but i'd been out to a number of the, the good yeah. lakes that they would consider them good but like up here, I haven't fished hardly anywhere in North Dakota or Minnesota. So like going to those lakes and being like a newbie into it, it's yeah. like you got to start somewhere. Well, you do. And, and like I remember one time I was giving a seminar at a sports show and this, and this single mom came up to me and she had two young kids, you know, we're talking about finding fish and doing this and doing that. And, you know, she's like, you know, what do I need to do to just to get these kids on some fish? You know, I don't have a lot of equipment. I don't have a lot of this or a lot of that. And the best answer I could come up with is, you know, she lived in Minnesota where there's all kinds of great panfish lakes. And um, I just told her, so, you know, you go out to these different lakes. They've got high numbers of crappies in them. They might not be the biggest fish, but you're, there's, there's lots of crappies. In the wintertime, I want you to look across the lake, and I want you to s- look and see where there's, say, 10 to 20 fish houses kind of grouped up together. I say you go right in the middle of them. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you've ever like had a black lab sitting next to you at the table where he kind of looks at you with those big eyes, you know, mm-hmm. waiting for you to throw some food his way. But you give, them, give the people that are fishing out there your best black lab impersonation where you're just looking at them for mercy, just, you know, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but you'd be really kind, you'd be respectful, you'd be polite. and say, hey, you know, I just need to get these kids into some fish. Is it okay if I fish by you? And I would guess that nine people out of ten would just... You know, here's here's what you do. Here's mm-hmm. what you use. Here's, and then you know, again, it goes back to that mentorship. Mm-hmm. But there's no sense in reinventing the wheel if you're just out looking for fish. Sometimes you can do the community things that everybody knows about. There's everybody's doing it for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. It's because usually it works. There's usually fish in those locations. Are you gonna catch the biggest fish? No. Are you gonna experience some of the most incredible, most aggressive bites? No. But as far as just catching fish, there's a time and place for that. Mm-hmm. You know, just going out to community spots per se, and and um, you know, and, and having some level of success. I think that's important for fishing as well, you know, mm-hmm. so. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are very secretive about fishing locations, but if you bring a kid out onto the ice or yeah, but if you're if you're over a hole, if you're over a crappie hole (laughs) and there's 20 ice castles sitting there, there's nothing secret about that, right? I mean, that's (laughs) and that's why I told them that is that with their skill set and what they had for knowledge and tools and experience, if they weren't going to go find some secret killer bite Mm -hmm. with 14 inch crappies, okay. They were, you know, just start with the basics because that's where we all started. I can remember being in high school and pulling up to a spot. I knew my ice auger would not start. And I would pull on it for a while until everybody saw that my ice auger wouldn't stop, start. Then I'd do the walk of shame to the closest <laughs> fisherman and ask them to borrow their eye. <laughs> I went awesome. through a whole year like that. That's know? awesome. So, yeah, I know, I know how it works. That's awesome. <laughs> Love it. So I, I'd like to move back to, to forward-facing sonar a little bit. So obviously it's it's kind of changing the way that we're fishing nowadays, and there's a lot of controversy around it. You know, um, if you haven't seen, Wisconsin's got it on the ballot to potentially ban forward-facing sonar. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that right now? Well, I, I don't know how you can ban it. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the controversy. I followed some of these stuff on YouTube and things like that. And, and, and I, I think, too, to be fair, you know, there's, I don't think it's on the ballot yet in Wisconsin. It was just brought up. It was one of the questions or one of the suggestions that anybody could send in, you know, as far as, you know, changing, you know, uh, regulations in Wisconsin. But... I don't know. I look at so many things. I mean, there was a time when monofilament was the biggest thing in fishing, okay? And there are people saying, oh, we got to ban monofilament because the fish can't see it. It's not fair. It's, uh, we're going to lower the lakes from catching so many fish, and our fisheries are going to be depleted and ruined. Um, you look at, um, then you, you fa- fast forward a few years, you look at a braided line, okay? And I get a kick out of where people are saying, oh, you know, we, we need to ban forward-facing sonar because you look at the, the last elite series, I mean, all five teams were using forward-facing sonar. It's like, well, where do you draw the line? You could have backed up 20 years ago and say, wow, we got a band braided line. Did you see that? All five of those people in the top five were using braid. They were fishing that heavy mill foil, and they were doing this and doing that, and those fish were safe before, and now people can go in there and fish them, and they don't have to worry about losing fish. And, I mean, has anything transformed musky fishing like braided line? Think about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, There's a time where you didn't have braided line for musky fishing, you know, or fluorocarbon leaders and titanium leaders for musky fishing. Okay, uh, you look at spot lock, right? I like to ban lake maps myself, for, but it's kind of nice to have it, you know. Mm-hmm. But then yeah. when everybody else has it, it's like wow, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so, I, but I can remember guiding before there were good lake maps and. Back then, you'd have all these waypoints of everything, and those waypoints meant something. Mm-hmm. Now, for $120, you can buy a map chip of just about every lake and have a lot of really good information. Now you're trying to find these little nooks and crannies that, for whatever reason, don't show up well on the map. You know, And so it's always evolving. And so I always look at, like, human beings are some of the most effective and deadly predators that ever walked the face of the earth. Okay? Amazing predators. But if you were to strip off all of our clothes and throw us outside naked, 50 degrees, we wouldn't make it till tomorrow morning, right? We always have to have these tools mm-hmm. in order to be effective. So it doesn't matter if you're hunting or fishing or whatever. And, and it's, it's fascinating because it's evolving all the time, okay? I, lo- I love to read a lot, and I love to read, like, historical journals and things from, like, this part of the world. And I find it fascinating, for example, like the time when Lewis and Clark came up the Missouri River or some of the early uh, people coming up and down the Red River Trail, okay, from Winnipeg to St. Paul at the time. And, you know, the, the early journals always talk about how basically some of the first people with gunpowder, for example, you could walk up to any elk or buffalo in, in, around and walk basically within 40 yards before it even lift up its head, okay? But once you got within longbow range, they were a different story, mm-hmm. right? And so the first people that had gunpowder just easiest, best hunting in the world. Well, then the natives started complaining, hey, you got to get out of here and hunt somewhere else because you're ruining our hunting. They had a lot harder time killing stuff with a longbow when everybody was using a rifle, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the animals adapted to that, okay? Or when the train tracks first came across Nebraska and the Dakotas and how at first they were shooting all kinds of buffalo right out of the train car, right? Well, then within a year of that, you had to go about 50 miles from each track to find buffalo again. They adapted, Mm -hmm. okay? And so you look at that and you think, wow, you know, this has been going on since millennium. I mean, there was a time where 
just a, a long bow is a huge advancement, right? Because everybody else is using a spear, right? And there was a time when monofilma was a huge advancement over Dacron line. There was a time where, you know, having a GPS, and then the GPSs got better. I remember back in the day where the GPSs were so bad where you drift past your marker buoy and you had to run up and get up on plane to figure out where you were exactly so you could line up on the next pass. <laughs> you know, you're still using a marker buoy, you know, whereas now the orientation and the mapping and everything. And so there's all these different things are always evolving. But what I look at is you look at today, I mean, we have some phenomenal fishing. We don't have worse fishing today. We've got phenomenal fishing. Now, fisheries cycle and ebb and flow, but I often felt, too, that when you take anglers and you make them really competent, and they're out there, and they're out there to learn, they're out there to have fun, it's a recreation in today's world, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not out there to fill your freezer or to see, how, you know, how many fish you can catch and flay at the end of the day, you know, whereas, you know, look at, like, say, the Depression years, like in the 30s, like, a, my grandpa would be ashamed of me if he knew how many fish I throw back because he didn't throw back anything back then, right? There was no money. There was no time. Nobody had time to do something like fish and hunt for fun. Mm-hmm. Like, it was all work, and, and, you know, and nobody had any money. It was really tough times. And so if you went fishing, yeah, you kept every fish you caught, and you mm-hmm. ate every single one of them, right? Because there wasn't money to buy groceries. But you look at how blessed we are today in today's world, it's, it's recreational, you know, and I always felt like if you teach somebody to fish and you make them good anglers, they don't have that desire to catch, kill, and conquer where they got to keep every fish. They're okay throwing fish back, you know. I mean, you look at like if you have like say a, a certified public accountant look at our expenditures, you know, say just for argument's sake, somebody has a $60,000 boat, which there's boats twice that much, and they have this and they have that and they've got gas and they've got all this stuff going into fishing. It isn't about how many pounds of fish you have at the end of the day, it's about the experience, the learning, the adventure, the entertainment, the, the, the great satisfaction that comes from just going out on the water, that solitude, the, the, there's a, uh, a therapeutic value to the outdoors that I think people sometimes don't appreciate if they're not outdoors people. But then, you know, you've got all these different things that, that make fishing or hunting or being outdoors make it so special for so many people. And at the end of the day, those are the stewards. Those are the conservationists. The people. No, nobody will look out for fisheries or fishing more than passionate anglers. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so I feel like if you can teach people to fish, give them the equipment where they can be competent. It's not a the deal where you're going to lower the lake from catching so many fish. You're going to have more passionate anglers, and, and people have an easier time releasing fish. You know, you see a lot of self restrict uh, self regulation with fishing where you know for most people they know they can catch fish tomorrow or the next day or whatever they don't have a problem throwing fish back they'll catch what they need they'll kill what they need to eat or whatever but then they're okay releasing fish it's not well i might not ever catch a fish again i'm going to hoard this as much as i can well it's good because i've never caught fish like this before in my life okay I, you know so i've always felt like when you when you um, and you know i remember al linder you know touching on that that facet years ago where, you know, if you teach people how to fish, they become your best stewards and ambassadors because, you know, it's not a conquest anymore. It's not a deal where they might not ever catch a fish again. They know they can catch fish whenever they want to. And so they don't have to hoard anything. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I look at forward facing sonar, just another step in that evolution. Uh, It's here to stay. It's fascinating. It's another piece of technology that, um, you know, they can help you catch fish, but there's a lot of nuance to it, too. It's not as easy as what people make it look like. No, I, I see, absolutely like, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you mentioned names or specific <clears throat> YouTube channels, but, you know, there's some YouTube channels where they're, like, totally against it. You know, like, it's just the worst thing that ever happened to fishing, and there's no mystery left. There's no this, you know, tell you what. In, or they have a real hard time with, you know, like, say, some young anglers fishing at a really high level and winning a tournament. You know, they don't know enough, nothing about bass fishing, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? If it was that easy, just pick one up and try it. There's a lot of nuance to it. And I think the biggest thing with forward-facing sonar is you almost have to relearn or reprogram yourself on how to fish. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm old enough where I, str- I, I struggle a lot harder with it than, say, a 23-year-old that doesn't have any history. I think I feel like the younger people can pick it up better. But at the end of the day, what is, is there anything better for the industry? I mean, you look at uh, the number of young anglers starting to get back into wildlife fishing tournaments. Mm -hmm. They're all standing up looking at forward-facing sonar casting off the front of the boat, whereas 20 years ago, you didn't see that many people standing up and casting. It was all trolling, back trolling, you know, dragging jigs, bottom bouncers. You know, you're fishing below or behind the boat. And forward-facing sonar is changing that. And so, yeah, I feel like, you know, 
in some cases, you know, you have to adapt with the times. If you if you're a tournament angler, you you know, you probably learn how to use it, or at least, you know, what fish your strengths. Okay, I look at like a a guy like uh, John Cox, okay, out of Florida, one of the best bass fishermen I've ever been around, and uh, I've gotten to know John pretty well just because we we share the same boat sponsor and uh, phenomenal angler. He's a phenomenal guy, and. Uh, he, I don't know how much money he's won in the last five years, but it's a career that most bass anglers would be very, very envious of. Most of the time, he doesn't even have a, a, a sonar on his boat that works. Okay. I mean, That's pretty wild. I remember one time in May, he ripped the transducer off the back of his boat and he laid it in the splash well. I hooked up with him in October. It was still laying there. <laughs> Crazy. But he's a master shallow water angler, okay? Mm-hmm. And you know what? There's times where that plays in his cards. There's times where that don't. But when it, when it does, you know, and if everybody's doing something offshore and he's got a population of fish along the bank or up shallow that, that he doesn't have to share with anybody, there's something to be said for that. Mm-hmm. And I do know this. I mean, you know, with fishing, you never say always. You never say never, right? But if everybody starts doing one thing and fishing a certain way, the person that zigs when everybody zags, wins tournaments right Mm -hmm. and so it's just a matter of time before that corrects itself anyways Mm -hmm. okay if it's all young people and it's all fishing offshore and you're fishing with forward facing sonar when enough people start doing it it won't be the same that always happens with fishing it won't be the same and then all and then you look at okay where situations are forward facing sonar isn't a factor I find it's not as much of a factor on river systems. When fish are tight to the bottom, there's current, there's uneven bottoms. I find that it's not as much of a factor in really, really shallow water. Uh, there's certain situations where it's not as much of a factor, okay? Well, guess what? If everybody starts doing this over here, somebody that dares to do something different over there will win a tournament. Well, then it'll go the other way. And so that's the thing with fishing is it ebbs and flows, okay? Uh, it, it might ebb this way where it's just all heavy cover and, you know, there was a time when 40-pound Power Pro was brand new and people were fishing the heaviest stuff or, or they were reeling fish over the beams of docks and, and that was a trend. And then it goes to offshore stuff. Then it goes this way and it's just kind of meandering all the time, you know, and you can't stop that. You, all you can do is embrace it and, and just enjoy the ride because it's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun to learn, right? I mean, it's a change. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, that's my take on it. Mm-hmm. So I've got a theoretical question for you. So say this forward-facing sonar does get banned. Um, would, you, would you change your fishing strategies that you would have had before it was ever created? Like, what have you learned that you would change? Or would you at all? I don't know. I mean, it's... Um I'll give you I'll give you one example that really opened my eyes. You know, just talking walleye fishing because that's I mean that's where I spend most of my time. I like to fish for everything, but but walleye is where I spend most of my time. Um, I've always been fascinated by how well lures like jigging wraps can work midsummer into the fall at times, where, where there are so many times where it's, you throw a jig in a minnow or, or whatever, drag a rig through a spot or whatever, and it's just like you're pulling your hair out trying to get bit, and you go through it and you start snapping a jigging wrap and it's just like boom 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 it's like wow like it's like it's like turning on a light switch how how profound that can be you know anybody that has confidence in that you know that you can relate to that like wow it's it's when it's on it's on and watching that on forward facing sonar what what's sort of become really obvious to me is that there's times where fish suspend way more than what we ever thought or realized we we knew they suspended but the problem is a lot of times when you go over the top of fish with boats they push down, okay? And so a lot of times in the summertime, say you see fish one foot, two foot off the bottom, before you went over the top of them, they might have been three or four or five, six feet off the bottom, okay? And as you go over the top, they just lower. And, you know, before forward-facing sonar, you know, I never realized that. And, you know, you look at a, a you know, like a bait like a jing wrap or a puppet minnow, whatever you're using, you know, when you, and you're snapping that bait and it's just like, the, it's just so profound how well it can work. I'm thinking, well, it's like an aggress- aggressive reaction by where the fish is laying there and this jigging wrap flies off the bottom and goes into the bottom and the fish just chase it. Like it's a, like people talk about triggering fish and a reaction bite and all this kind of stuff. 
But I, I don't know if it really has to, anything to do with that anymore. I think that what it is is that that fish is three, four feet off the bottom, and that glide bait comes up in front of that fish for a little bit, and then it goes down. It gets right in front of that fish for just even a second, half second, and then that fish chases it down, whereas before we were just fishing below the fish the entire time and never even realized it. Okay. And so, you know, th there's things like that that have just opened up my eyes, or at least I feel like I have a better understanding sometimes of, of how fish chase down, how fish chase up, how fish move. Um, you know, there's times, for example, you'll cast into fish and you'll spook them, and you have to cast past them and come through them to catch them. But then there's other times if you try to come through them, they spook and you have to land, you know. And so it's kind of crazy where... And then the other thing is how much fish spook from our presence. You know, I knew fish spooked, but until you see it, you, you know, you can't wrap your head around it, you know. And there's times, for example, where, you know, you can't get a boat within, say, 30 feet of fish. Like, here's what's crazy is you look at Mille Lacs, Leech Lake. There's some iconic lakes in Minnesota, for example, where because of zebra mussels or other factors, the water's really cleared up. And those are places where if you were to back up, say, 30, 35 years ago, it was a lot of back trolling, right? It was Lindy rigs and putting air in night crawlers, bail open, getting a bit bite and counting to five and then rearing back and setting the hook. And I tell you what, there's a lot of renowned walleye fisheries where the days of catching fish below the boat are, are, are pretty limited, where you need like a horrendous wind or you need some type of a th factor that, to have that happen because you just can't catch fish below the boat anymore, right? The fish are just spooking off the boat all the time. And, and there's a lot of those lakes where you get 20, 30 feet from the fish and then they start to just push away. It's almost like you're chasing ghosts, you know? And then now we're starting to see too where fish are starting to spook from forward-facing sonar, okay? Uh, NWT was up on Devil's Lake last year and the weights were huge and was, you, know, you, could, you could account it to forward-facing sonar. And those fish haven't seen a lot of that where you could just basically point it at the fish and you can get that fish to come right below the boat in six feet of water and catch it below the boat and watch the whole thing go down. Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. But there's places, especially in Minnesota, where a lot more pressure and a lot more people using it, where the days of finding a fish and just staying on the fish the entire time, casting at the fish and then watching that fish eat, those days are kind of coming to an end, where the, the, the windows we can do that are narrower and narrower, where it seems like the fish are starting to spook, where the, you, you, you point it at them and the fish push away or they drop into the body, you'll see a response from it. Or, you know, and, and so it's almost like you're, you're find the fish and then you turn it away immediately and then cast at them blind you know mm -hmm. so that's evolving too you know and so where's that gonna go i don't know you know it's almost like everything else you know i mean you know it's like sometimes a boat scares fish sometimes it don't sometimes forward facing sonar scares fish sometimes it don't you know right now it's on most lakes i would say 80 percent of the time it, it don't right but we're starting to see more and more instances where you kind of scratch your head thinking huh there might be something to this. Is that know? just because they're relating that feeling of whatever the sonar can gives them? It to definitely feels like they can sense it. Okay. I, I, I tell mm -hmm. people it makes good bites better, but it makes tough bites tougher. Sure. If you're on a tough bite, it can, it can, it can, it can hurt you because the other thing is you got to be a lot more careful managing your time with forward-facing sonar. You think the day flies by, like hey, I don't know if you ever fished in a tournament and bombed in a tournament, but I I know what that feels like. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you're going to say you caught fish really good the day before and you go back to your spot and you're all amped up and you're fishing and you're trying different things and nothing's happened, nothing's happening. All of a sudden you look at your watch and it's like, oh, my God, it's noon. How did that happen so fast? we got to do something, making a change, right, where the day can get away from you. You have to be even more diligent about managing your time with forward-facing sonar because you, there's a saying, you know, you don't leave fish to find fish, but with forward-facing sonar you do have to leave fish at times. You know, if they're not responding the way you want it, and, you know, basically it's the first cast or two, and you got to move on. You, know, mm -hmm. you just can't keep chasing and, and, and dying on that one fish. And, and the other thing, too, is with, with forward-facing sonar, is there's a lot of fish that kind of look like walleyes, <laughs> you know, and so you got to avoid that. You know, and what I find is that walleyes usually respond. Might not be the response you want, but they usually react, okay? Uh, and I find that walleyes are very curious in the sense that if, you, if you're casting through fish, and you, it's almost like you're invisible where they don't move and spook or they don't follow you, they don't do nothing. Usually they're suckers or some kind of rough fish, but there's almost, you almost always get a reaction with walleyes, you know, and so but they're being able to determine what's a walleye and what's not, you know, or what's a bass and what's not, you know, and especially with reservoirs, you have this huge biomass of different fish species, you know, and a lot of them kind of hang out around walleyes, you know, and so that's the other thing is it takes a lot of time and nuance to really get it to work for you. And sure. so that's why some of the controversy around it, I can just tell by the things that people say that, ah, they've never used it. It's not that easy. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like ice fishing, right? I mean, that's a, uh, a legitimate concern as well. Forward facing sonar, people can find suspended fish. You know, you might have barrel trauma issues. Uh, people can, you know, increase the harvest. A lot of times when people are pan fishing, they're keeping fish to eat. That could potentially have a, have a negative effect on our fisheries. But the reality is that you have to hustle and work really hard to make it work for you. If you're just going to plop down in your fish house and turn on your forward-facing sonar, it's entertaining. You watch the fish come by, but you're not going to probably catch any more fish than you did before. you got to use it to find fish and hustle, and it's, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. And those people are already catching fish. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it's not the end-all, be-all. It's, it's just another fascinating tool that's given us a lot of really fascinating information that I think can, you know, help us. Yeah. But um, you got to learn how to use it, too. I've only There's got- a lot to it. I've only got one open water season and one ice season under my belt using active sonar. And I can attest to the fact that it is it's super difficult to figure out right away. And it's just, it's got to take time. Yeah, you got to spend time. You know, even uh, tweaking your, your, um, your angle of your transducer, you know, mm-hmm. and even, uh, you know, making sure that your arrow is perfectly calibrated either on the trolley motor or on your pole, mm-hmm. you know, so that you can make accurate casts. I mean, and let's face it, you know, with walleye fishing, walleye anglers never really had to learn how to cast real well. You're just going for distance here between halfway to the shore or whatever, right? But but to be able to flick a jig in a cup, that was more of a bass fishing thing, right? Wall anglers never had to do that or learn how to do that, you know. And um, and so you look at, you know, being able to cast good enough to where you see a fish and then being able to make a perfect cast, you know, because you can screw up a fish by making a bad cast, you know, mm-hmm. especially if it's a big fish and there's not many big fish, you don't want to screw it up, you know. So... You know, and it's not for everything either. Like, say, if you were to, say, take out, say, three people. Say you had three relatives in town. You wanted to go out and catch up some walleyes or whatever. You know, you probably want to, you know, say you're dragging a bottom bouncer behind the the boat. Everybody's reeling in some fish. You're talking, whatever. Whereas forward-facing sonar, sometimes it feels, at least for myself, I feel selfish sometimes when I fish. Mm -hmm. Since I'm on the front of the boat and I'm picking off fish I can see, and the person on the back of the boat is really struggling i mean you're gonna outfish them 10 to 1 Mm -hmm. okay fishing that style or that way and then if you both get on the front of the boat you can take turns or whatever but you know if you get more than say two people in the boat you just like rotate i mean how do you do that you know and so it's not for everything that way either Mm -hmm. you know so i don't know it's it's got its place yeah absolutely it does i don't see it going away though i don't see any states banning it i I mean, I remember when underwater cameras came out and there was a legislation in Minnesota where they wanted to ban underwater cameras. Then you found out it was the rep- state representative, the buddy of the camera person. It was good, it was good uh, marketing. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> hey, yeah. push Funny this bill through. Works, so. Just make sure it doesn't go through, but just get it up to a <laughs> state where, you know, so everybody get, get up the pole it. far mm-hmm. enough. Cause enough buzz. Yeah. Talking about banning underwater That's camera, funny. you know. And again, <laughs> yes. underwater camera is awesome until the water's dirty or it's dark, you know, mm-hmm. then not so yeah. awesome. It's not awesome either. We have a big wall and you got the big cord hanging down either. Mm-hmm. You want to mm-hmm. see a fire drill. You know, there's times where we'll use underwater cameras in some of the really clear lakes up north, lake trout fishing. You're in 80 feet of water. You want to see a fire drill, somebody have, a say, a 35-inch lake trout on, and you're trying to pull up 70 feet of camera cord as fast as you can. <laughs> you want to get that out of there, yeah. right? It's cool for about 15 seconds, uh, and as soon as that fish hits, he's like, get it out of there, you know? So, yeah, it's like funny. everything else, you know? Nice. Well, so let's transition a little bit to open water, spring fish and stuff. So um, what, uh, what sort of areas do you really like to target, and um, what sort of baits do you like to use the most? Well, a lot of it's rivers, obviously. You know, a place where you have closed seasons, you've got, you know, fishing opportunities on rivers, whether it's Mississippi River, Rainy River. You know, obviously the Missouri River doesn't ever close, but uh, a lot of it's river fishing. Like around Devil's Lake, you know, I was just fishing this morning, which is earliest I've ever been able to fish open water from shore. And, um, you know, fishing around current areas where there's, you know, fish are attracted to current in the spring, you know, bottlenecked areas, bridges and stuff. And, you know, and that's something to point out, too, is... Um, <laughs> I see it over and over and over again. So this isn't a fluke, okay? And I think people, if they're honest, they'll attest to this, is that in the, in the springtime, some of the biggest fish every year get caught from shore, right? You think about that. Some of those shore anglers have access to some of the best spots. And if you're, you know, fishing in a fancy fiberglass sparkly boat, you can't really go in there and fish 15 feet in front of them, right? And so they've got some of the best spots kind of blocked off, right? And you look at that, the fish are shallow and... Um, you look at how good you can, I mean, I've seen in Wisconsin, I've seen in, 
you know, around Bismarck, I've seen on Devil's Lake. There's some phenomenal shore fishing for walleyes in the spring. And that's the beauty of fishing is if you want to make it rocket science and have all the latest and greatest, that's cool. You can do that. But you can also keep it as simple as you want and have some level of success. You know, you look at kayak anglers, you look at shore fishermen or shore fisherwomen. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can go. But um, I've seen it often where people fishing from shore are out fishing people from boats in the springtime, you know. And I think there's something to be said for that. I think that's kind of cool yeah. myself, mm-hmm. you know. And it really so, levels the playing field. Yeah, it, you know what? You, you can, you, that's what's so cool about fishing is that no matter what your personality trait is, no matter what you're looking to get out of fishing, you can find it, right? Some people say, you know what? I don't want nothing to do with forward-facing sonar. i got to work on, on technology all day, and I go fishing to get away from all that stuff. I leave my phone in the truck, and I, I, I just want just nothing. I just want to hear geese, and I want to hear birds, and I want to hear water sloshing off my oar. I would just want to go out in my kayak and, and fish, or I just want to put on a pair of waders and just wade out in a river and fish and not have all that technology. I, get, I go fishing and get away from it is what you know, some people feel, and that's fine. And that's cool because you can, you can accomplish that and do that you know, and have a lot of success. You know? And so you know, that's the thing is you look at like small rivers and stuff. Uh, we filmed an uh, episode on the Cheyenne River a while back with Ben Olson from Shields here. You know, we were just sliding around the mud, and it was all muddy, and we were wearing waders. And in this river, the deepest part of the river might have been five, six feet deep, catching all kinds of walleyes. Really? You know? I mean, we had a Ziploc bag full of jigs and twister tails. and pla- pla- I, mean, we, I mean, you could have used an ugly stick rod. It didn't matter. I mean, you know, you could have you went and got set up for less than $50 and, you know, caught some really nice fish, you know. That's cool. And it's a narrow window in the spring when that happens, right? It doesn't happen all year, but there's times and places where you can have ex- exceptional fishing without a lot of equipment. And so that's one of the th- neat things about what's happening right now for the next three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, whatever, depending on where you're at, is there's some phenomenal fishing that doesn't take a lot of equipment happening right now from here on out into, you know, these fish are in pre-spawn especially. And obviously, you know, the, the the rivers will attract a lot of boating attention as well. There's some people that are going out on Lake Erie, you know. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I love jigs and plastics. I love fishing that way. Uh, there's a time and place for pulling crankbaits. But uh, I would say between cranks and jigs and plastics would be kind of my two things I maybe lean on the most, you know, for spring rivers at least. So. Mm-hmm. Nice. Talk to us a little bit about that Northland eye candy. Oh, well... I tell you what, I, I fell in love with it when I started testing the prototypes. I mean, I've, I've been using it for like three years now. And uh, I remember the first prototypes, they were black or they were white. You know, there was no <laughs> fancy color schemes or nothing like that. But we really got the profiles and the shapes dialed in. Because that elastic plastic technology has been around for a little while, but, uh, you know, it was all real bass-centric. You, know, you look mm-hmm. like a Ned Rig, and, you know, there's some phenomenal bass baits that were made out of that elastic plastic, but nothing that was really more geared towards walleyes with the profiles and the shapes and the, and the colors. And so I started using that, and, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed about it is it's very soft and stretchy. You can catch a lot of fish on it. It's very durable. You can catch multiple fish on it, like way more than a normal plastic. Uh, I can. I was given a seminar a couple of weeks ago, and I, I could bite it and not bite. I mean, you can't hardly tear it in two. You know, it's it's amazing how durable it is. Um, it's very soft, where it doesn't take hardly anything for it to move and come alive. So it's got phenomenal action. Uh, it floats, and so it makes it a little different. I really like it. Like on well, with a jig, I, I like it. But obviously, you know, drop shotting I think is a is a technique that kind of came from the bass world basically. But it's it's catching more and more walleyes all the time drop mm-hmm. shotting is deadly for walleyes at times um and then i started using on on spinner harnesses quite a bit because it floats it keeps the spinner harness up off the bottom a little bit and um then the other thing I started using it is it really uh, absorbs scent a lot more than a lot of other traditional pv plastics and so uh I, and i started playing around with scent a lot i wasn't i i would say that most of my life i've been kind of skeptical about scent I mean, people brag about this and brag about that. To me, I didn't really put a lot of merit into it. I like the profile, the shape, the color. Those are the things that I looked at in a soft plastic, whether it smelled like, tasted like banana or, or you know, some secret fish formula or it didn't really, that didn't really trip my trigger. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, again, I was, you know, I, I got a lot of friends that, you know, fish, you know, the high level bass tournament stuff. And, and some of those, guys were, were um, 
you know, starting to soak baits and do different things with baits with scent and stuff. And they were telling me some things about it. And I thought, well, oh, maybe, maybe it's worth looking at, you know. And so I started to, uh, you know, I, I use Gulp Alive a lot. I use um, Procure has some really good scents that I've had good luck with. But I started using those elastic plastics that I can. I started soaking it in, uh, in scents. And what I found is there's situations where it definitely seemed like you'd catch fish. Or, mm-hmm. or it's, it felt like I was catching more fish because of Make it, a right? Like I, I can remember casting at fish, you know, either I saw on side imaging or forward facing sonar and just going right by the fish and nothing. And then I'd replace the eye candy, put a new one on. They've been soaking and gulp alive for three or four hours and just getting bit immediately. And so it really seemed like cold water, slow speeds is one situation, dirty water. Uh, whenever the fish are just off a little bit, and you got to really slow down, especially with plastics. Um, I feel like the, the there, there can be something to that scent factor. And then with that, with that particular type of plastic, it absorbs the scent a lot better than traditional plastics. Okay, mm-hmm. and so it, it makes a big difference at times. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I use it a lot. I mean, it was. I mean, well, you guys got it in last summer. I mean, they weren't going to launch it last summer, and we started catching so many fish on it. Myself and Tom Wynn and some other guys that they did kind of what they call a soft launch, where they just got as much of it made as they could. And then I think you guys were basically one of the one of the few retailers that was able to get your hands on it last summer and it was just sold out every time that the shipment came it was just sold out and so it was a it was a home run but um you know obviously you have to catch fish but then the next step is you got to catch fish in order for it to sustain that and uh and you know I, I think it's a deal where it's it's so much different than regular pv plastics that you figure out the applications and the uses for it, like whoa this is different like and i can do different things with it you know and um and you know, people catching a lot of fish with it. You know, people could fall in love with it. You know, now is it the end all be all? Well, there's still a time where I like to use PV plastics, for example, uh, during big algae blooms, fishing over the tops of weed beds. I like to use big thumping paddle tails where that stiffer plastic seems like it displaces and moves more water, okay? And so there's a time and place for traditional PV plastics. You know, like we use a lot of the impulse stuff with the Northland line, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. But I tell you what, cold water, slow speeds, harnesses, that impulse is the best thing that I know of, you know, at least, you know, for walleye applications. So. Mm-hmm. And it's, so, like, how long would you soak that stuff when you're using this? Sentence? You know, I've got tubs that I just have stuff soaking in all the time. And I'll use something for maybe an hour or so, and then I'll just swap it out. Mm-hmm. I'll just take it off the hook, throw it back in the tub, and just rotating them maybe every hour or so. Mm-hmm. But I've noticed sometimes, though, that if, I'm, if I know I'm going through fish and, I, and they're not biting, it's amazing how, I don't know if, like, if you ever fish for like eel powder, walleyes, or crappies after dark, and you know, there's times where glow makes a difference, where you charge a lure and you put it down, and, it's just, and mm-hmm. you're, you're getting bit. And... You, you, you say you, you're not marking fish, you're not getting bit, and you see fish or whatever, and you reel up and you glow it and then put it down, and it's like kind of an instant thing that you can sometimes see. Yeah, that's kind of how it is sometimes, where you're going through fish and nothing, you put a new one on that's got that scent on it that's been soaking, and it's just, just immediate. You know? And so to me, that's eye-opening. You know? With fishing, it's easy to jump to conclusions or make assumptions sometimes that are just dead wrong. You know, because if we want to believe something, you will, you know, and you'll find, you'll find your own truth to, to justify it. And so sometimes with fishing, you know, you got to, you know, kind of see things over and over and over again before you can really feel comfortable thinking, you know, that really seems like, feels like it makes a difference, you know, because just catching a few fish doesn't always tell you the whole story. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the tough thing about fishing. What makes fishing pretty fascinating is that, you know, you can't, it's easy to jump to conclusions, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality. If all three of us were using a quarter ounce chartreuse jig, there's days where one of us will catch 80% of the fish, but we're all using the same thing and doing the same thing, fishing out of the same boat, right? Why is one person catching all the fish? Is it a cadence lift off the bottom? Is it a deal where the front of the boat's two feet shallower? Is it a deal where the back of the boat, you're letting out more line and getting away from the boat? But there's all these different variables that, you know, that, 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 that are big picture things that a lot of times are more important than the than the actual lure if that makes any sense and so you know i always hesitate to you know you never say always or never with fishing but i can feel comfortable and confident you know looking anybody in the eye and say you know what there's a time and place where yeah I, i'm starting to warm up to the scent thing you know <laughs> and i'm like the last guy because i remember back in the day they had uh 
Dr. Juice. They, they made fuzzy hooks and fuzzy this and fuzzy that. You dip it and squirt stuff on or whatever. You know what? They're, they don't exist. I mean, it's like the color select. There's things that people try that obviously didn't work. Otherwise, it'd still be around and people would still be talking about it. And that's kind of how I looked at a lot of that stuff. But I'm starting to warm up to... Uh, sent, you know, and, and I remember up at Winnipeg, you know, a guy was using some of that Procure, and he, he turned me on to Procure, where he was squirting it and, and spurting it on his rattle baits and stuff. And, you know, the guy was out fishing me, you know. And uh, was it because he was on fish and I wasn't? Was it because he was fishing over here and I'm over there and the fish are coming from his direction? Was it because, you know, his cadence, you know, maybe he was locked on a little bit more, you know, in the zone, confident? Or I'm just kind of spinning my wheels saying, God, what am I doing wrong? You know, I mean, there's a lot of things with fishing sometimes, but, uh, um, but he's a phenomenal angler. And, um, you know, and you start seeing things that, you know what, I'm going to try this. And if you have success with it, well, then you keep doing it. And if you have more success, well, then it starts to get in your head, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, ton of information. Really appreciate you joining us, Jason. And, uh. Yeah, I'm, you got me excited to get in a boat and do some <laughs> I'm open excited. water I mean, stuff. I, I can't wait to, <laughs> I, like the rainy river's been on my brain all spring, you know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be a long window this year. I mean, people mm-hmm. just started getting out a couple of days ago. They just cleared off Birchdale, and there'll be more ramps up and down the river that people will be able to use. And, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about the flooding, the dirty water, the forks breaking. I mean, I don't think any of that's going to be as a factor. It's going to be busy. It's going to be low water. Um, but I got a jet boat mm. just for fishing rivers, and... Uh, I'm looking forward to I can't That'll wait to perfect. get up. That's definitely on my list. I'm going to Green Bay next week and uh, doing some stuff out there. So, yeah, I, a lot of good stuff ahead here. So Yeah, absolutely perfect. And we'll be following along. Yeah, see how for it sure. Goes. So, again, thank you for your time. And, yeah, yeah, thank you. And good luck fishing. You bet. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.